So before I start any further, I'd like to uh, introduce the, the members of council that are here, and we actually have each and every one of them here today. So Deputy Mayor Kirsten Gardner over here. Um, <coughs> We have Councillor uh, Don Lewis. <laughs> Councillor Archie Mellon and uh, Councillor Lloyd Wells over there in the in the far side. So we are here today to open a very special building in the Airpaw Campground. Even before we started this term, we of council, the previous council, had committed to removing the old building and creating new. It had committed $350,000 along with some other needs to build a new building. This council re remained committed to the project. John approached me and then council to fund an upgrade to the building, which would include the kitchen, the meeting space, and more amenities. After much negotiation and a tender that came in way too high, we finally came to a design and pricing structure that suited both South Dundas and John. Along with the $350,000, there was a significant amount of staff time along with some extras which added to our half of the project. John provided the rest along with his expertise in design. In total, I believe we spent together over $750,000. I would like to say the partnership worked out well and we now have a building that will serve not only the campsite but the lawn bowling club and, and the airport facility which sponsors a popular fly-in breakfast. And I'm very impressed today that uh, many of your uh, co-pilot friends have come today, John, to celebrate. I'd like to thank John for his generous donation along with his expertise and vision. He continues to support Airquaf, especially the waterfront lands. I need also to thank the additional sponsors and volunteer labor John had to do some of the work. I would like to recognize EBB Engineering of Cornwall and Wells and Sun Construction out of uh, Morrisburg for the work they did on building design and construction. In the end, we now have a campground building that is second to none and will provide, the ser provide service to this municipality for many years to come. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, um, I'm gonna call on John Ross. Uh, John has uh, certainly done a lot in uh, in Village of Iroquois right from the start and uh, he's brought a lot of things here so uh, with no further ado, John. Thank you John. Thank you Stephen. I've written out my speech yeah. because I have, as I told Stephen, a, a habit of wandering. <laughs> I've been given five minutes. I think this will take five and a half, but compared to the thousands of hours I put in here, I think I can be given an extra half minute. We'll give it to you, John. We'll give, me, we'll give you two. How's that? <laughs> okay, two minutes. Thank you. And you know I'll take four of them. Well, I know that. <laughs> We've had our talks. You know that. <laughs> okay. We have visitors today who have flown in that, that are not as knowledgeable as the local community is. So I'd like to give you a, just a little bit of uh, history about the, uh, the airport and the predecessor of the uh, airport building. In 1967, the Iroquois Airport was established as a grass runway by George Jackson, and that was as a centennial project. At that time, it was common for groups of recreational planes to fly across Canada together, perhaps all the way from Halifax to Victoria, B.C., and they needed places to stay and stop to camp overnight. George saw there was a chance to put Iroquois on the aviation map. So in 1968, he designed and built the original Iroquois Airport building, and some people might remember it. It was be located behind this building. It was a nice blue little building, and it did the job. The building included a large covered area under which the fly-in <coughs> breakfast could be cooked. It became one big kitchen, and at other times there were many other activities, musical activities, card playing, and so on that went on under that shelter. Because the building had washrooms and showers, a small camp, camp, campground soon was established around the airport building. 
and over the next 31 years, this campground was entirely self-funded and grew to the present 69 sites. As more and more seasonal campers were attracted, the covered area and social facilities that were held under it became ever more important, and a vibrant social life followed. Among the campers were talented musicians. Their concerts under the stars soon became legendary and have attracted quality musicians from all over Eastern Ontario. This became a very special place. Saturday night here was something to see, I'll tell you, and other times when the, the locals were practicing. I moved to Iroquois in 1974 because your airport would allow me to better enjoy my hobby of flying and also, that's New York State. Right across the river is the largest customer base for Ross Video for broadcasting equipment. And there's a bridge nearby. So I talked to Reeve Davis at the time when we made a chance visit, after we made a chance visit here, and my young son David was with me on a very rainy day. We were on our way down Highway 2. I was a bit discouraged about finding a place to, to move Ross Video to. And Reeve Davis said to me on a later occasion, why are you considering Toronto? You'll just be like a drop in a big ocean. You come here and you'll make a big difference to our community. So I listened and I thought about it brought my family here, and there's the lot is still here where we put our ragtop tent trailer, the third or fourth owner, and we walked around town to see whether we would like Iroquois. I'm sure you remember it. It came on more than one occasion to get a feel for the place. Eventually, the, uh, there was a problem in finding a place to for my family that my friend George Jackson eventually said, I can solve the problem, I have a house. It was right here, a beautiful house overlooking the park, and he moved his family into a single wide tent trailer in the middle of a muddy field back there, so that my family, David and his sister, and my wife and I could move here and we could bring our company. Talk about community spirit. I learned a lot from him. Also, I had asked Lloyd Davis, I said, you have all these facilities. You've got a beach, you've got a campground, you've got lawn bowling, you can have your own boathouse, and so on. What's the size of the community? He said 1,200. I said, I don't know any community in Canada that has those social facilities. How did that happen? He said, it's all the work of volunteers, not the council. We support them. They come up with the ideas and we help them, them implement them. So everything, even including the golf course at that time, was the inspiration of volunteers. He said, when you come, join them. You can help us too. And I did. A few years ago, when the original building reached the end of its useful life, there were questions as to what was desirable in a replacement building. Now, coincidentally, the nearby lawn bowling club had just lost the use of their clubhouse. And I saw a chance to add the bowlers to the user groups, and, a, and they could have a new clubhouse at a virtually no additional cost. They had some special requirements too. Sit down banquet for 65. The room wasn't quite big enough. I enlarged the room. Okay, tell me more, and so on. So I asked the users to define in detail their social needs and not overlook anything. Now, being an engineer with a background also in architecture, I translated their needs into a detailed layout for this building. And over the course of many meetings, the users must have told me everything because I've never had them point out recently any omissions. So I guess we did it right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's important to note that all the design aspects of this building are evidence-based. My waterfront committee runs on the basis of evidence. People can have opinions, gut feels, and so on, but you have to dig and find what's the evidence behind it. If the evidence exists, you're on solid ground and the project will probably succeed. And the thing 
that also is that there'll probably be very few surprises later and needs for change and cost overruns of any sort. Now, before I conclude, I find it necessary to respond to what somebody recently has said publicly. I don't know why Iroquois has an airport. So that statement was made publicly. I observed it on television. And therefore, this is a public occasion, so it's, I have the occasion to respond. If George Jackson had not made the original grass runway, the park would probably still be the mosquito-infested swamp that it was when I arrived in 1974. Son David Ross and I surveyed it. We found it was a bowl. No wonder it never dried out, even in the middle of summer. And it's mosquito pools everywhere. I took the larva and fed our, our tropical fish. They loved it. <laughs> but we didn't love the mosquitoes. So we obtained permission from the council of the time to put in ditches without cost to them and drain the land, which we did. I also, in my engineering school, they didn't have enough electronics to teach me, and I had two years of civil engineering and learned how to make ditches, roads, and all that sort of thing. So I was able to design the runway. Therefore, all you see in this park, the walking paths, the, new, the expanded beach, the beautiful park benches, new lighting of the lawn bowling court, the new air camping area out here, by the way, were the planes that I thank Mayor Bybells too for approving that. Grandpa, this there's an airplane coming in. Crucial so that we could bring planes right okay. from the runway to park and camp out there and use this facility. And uh, that was a very good thing to have done. And my wife and I surveyed all of that, designed the ditches and the drainage and everything. So, um, the other thing is, of course, along with me came Ross Savinio, now your largest and impressively successful employer. All of this would never have happened in Iroquois unless it, the runway attracted me because not only do you want a successful business, you want a good personal life, and flying was my hobby. So that's the answer. Why do we have a runway, and how have we benefited? So you never know when you have something like a runway that doesn't by itself seem to be useful to all the people, what good will come of it, and a huge amount of good has come. Now one. Last thing, um, many of you know that my wife died very suddenly, just over, well, about six weeks ago, uh, totally unexpected. And she had a huge effect on this building, the appearance, the feel of it, to a certain extent, the color, the acoustic treatment, so on. She was a big part in the design, but hidden behind me, of course. So it's very fitting and pleased that her name is also on the plaque as a donor. I, I thank you for that. Thank you. Well, once again, I'd like to, on behalf of uh, Miss Valley, South Dundas, council, staff, everybody here, to thank John again for his certainly generous donation, his expertise in, in getting what we've got. And as he said, you know, we did a lot of work here. And Airfoil wouldn't be Airfoil if uh, John Ross hadn't come to uh, that, I guess, freak visit to come to a village in the middle of nowhere uh, to establish his business. So once again, yeah.